Hello everyone. Today we will be presenting to you Odometry 101 from FTC 13356 Roboforce. So in today's presentation, we will be covering an introduction of our team, what odometry is, and then an overview of odometry in slightly more specific details, such as different types of odometry and our own personal experience with it. Then we will be covering hardware and software aspects of odometry, and finally a summary. So our team, we are team FTC 13356 Roboforce, as I previously said, we are from Fremont, California and a fourth year team. Currently, we have seven members and we're also affiliated with the organization Code for Fun. On the right, you can see our last season's robot from Freight Frenzy. And our mission is to take innovation to the next level. So what is odometry? Well, let's start off by defining it. It's a way of accurate robot field localization and navigation. In general, there are three main types, motor encoder, dead wheel, which we'll be focusing on mostly for today, and visual. Odometry allows us to know robot's x, y, and angle relative to its starting position. On the bottom, you can see the diagram, which illustrates that the robot can track its angle, x, and y positions. To the right of that, you can see a camera that is often used for visual odometry. And on the very right, you can see an example of dead wheel odometry. Now I will be explaining the different types of odometry. The first one is a wheel motor encoder odometry that measures the rotations of the motor. So it returns the positions of the motors that connect to the wheels of the drivetrain. Now, the encoder itself is attached at the back of the motor, and then it has a breakout cable that connects the JST PH ports to the rev control hubs. The second one is a uh, dead wheel odometry. This uh, type of localization requires three odometry pods, two in parallel and one perpendicular. This is because it needs to be able to measure laterally and straight. So a freely spinning wheel is connected to the encoder and then it's sprung down to ensure that it's always in contact with the ground. So this type of odometry returns the position of three different dead wheel encoders. Now the last type is visual odometry. Uh, this is also called VSLAM, which is visual simultaneous localization and mapping. So it's constantly maps its surroundings and triangulates its position through the camera, and the camera is connected to the rev control hub via a USB port. So we have tried all three of these, and then uh, this is our own experience. The first one is the dead wheel odometry, and we believe this is the most reliable and accurate one because the pod wheels are sprung into the ground, so it's always staying in contact. So another type is motor encoder odometry, and these ones, we believe, will uh, build up error over time due to the lack of traction in the wheels, and it leads to inconsistencies. And drifting also occurs when traveling at high speeds, but with limited slow movement, it can still be somewhat accurate. And the last one is visual odometry, and having used the Intel RealSense T265, our team believes it is inconsistent, especially in uh, different environments, like uh, because there's many different environmental variables, like the distance from the roof. Now let's talk about the hardware aspect of odometry. So odometry, you can have a two, three, or four pause setup. Uh, so this kind of depends on uh, your situation and how much space you have, but with odometry, the more odometry pods you have, the more accurate your data is. Uh, so with each odometry pod, there's an omni wheel which drives the encoder. So this omni wheel is uh, a dead wheel. So that basically means that the omni wheel is free spinning on bearings. And on the odometry pod case, uh, you have a place for a pivot point. The pod rotates, which the pod rotates around. And then there's a spring mechanism which pushes the pod downward towards the playing field for an even contact to the playing field. So when the robot moves, the dead wheel moves. Uh, so this is because of the spring mechanism forcing the wheel down against the surface of the playing field. And in turn, this spins the encoder. And now the encoder can track the robot's position. So when you combine two or three of them of these pods together, uh, you'll be able to track the X and Y heading of your robot. So some key design factors. Uh, so the first one is where are you going to put them? So wherever you decide to put your odometry pods will then dictate the size of your odometry pods. Uh, so the second thing is, are there any obstacles 
that are on the playing field that will hinder the downward trade performance. So for example, in Freight Frenzy last season's uh, challenge, uh, the game field had barriers and some teams wanted to go across them. Uh, but when you go across them, uh, the robot lifts up and that means your downward trade pods are uh, sticking out below. And then this could leave us susceptible be, to being hit by the barrier and in turn that could damage it and maybe break it. And then the third thing is uh, what manufacturing process you have, uh, you have access to. Uh, so most custom uh, dometry pods uh, use 3 printed, 3D printed uh, plates or cases. And sometimes in the case of one dometry pod, uh, they replace the 3D printed plates with uh, CNC aluminum. And then with springs, uh, the different rubber bands uh, or springs to use uh, have different like strength and with different shrink rubber bands come a variety of different accuracies. So keep that in mind. Uh, so next, different types. Uh, so there are three main types of odometry, regular, linear, and retractable. So regular is like the most used, most popular setup. Uh, so it's just uh, a pod and then there's an extension spring which forces the pod downward towards the playing field and then this pod rotates around one axis of rotation and so for linear odometry uh, there's a set of uh, guides that the odometry pod moves up and down and then the pods are sprung linearly with compressions compression springs uh, that are on the guides so in the top in the top picture here you can see the guides and then the compression springs and then for retractable, it's just a normal normal odometry setup, but then there's an added manual servo retraction. Uh, so in like last year's game, uh, before the teams went across the barrier, the barrier, uh, if they have retractable odometry, they can just retract the odometry pod up, and then the the they could safely go over the barrier without the odometry pod getting damaged. And so the main components of an odometry pod. Uh, so the omni wheel. So why we choose an omni wheel? Well, an omni wheel has rollers that are perpendicular to the wheel's orientation. So when the robot strafes or moves sideways, uh, those rollers uh, move with the robot, and this doesn't so the, so, the, so that it doesn't like affect uh, the robot's sideways movement. And then there's the encoder which tracks the rotations of the omni wheel, and then the side plates are what hold the whole pod together. So good structural integrity. And then the bearings are what allow for the dead wheel, omni wheel, and then the axis of rotation to move freely around the axle. And then this last thing is the spring. So this presses the omni uh, wheel towards the ground for an even contact to get good accuracy in your data. Uh, so some recommended parts. Uh, so this is just a list of some parts that FTC teams use for their uh, odometry pods. So for encoders, uh, so we have most teams use red through bore encoders, uh, but in past seasons, people have used US, the US Digital S14 and EAT encoders. Uh, so a downside with the Brev encoders is that they take up a pretty large footprint, and the US Digital ones, they take up a pretty small footprint, but, uh, but for the US Digital encoders, uh, they're kind of like out of date, and they're not like modernized, and they're pretty, uh, they're not as durable as the Rev ones, and also specifically for the S4T, uh, they're quite expensive. Uh, so for Omni wheels, there, are, there were two main ones that we saw, uh, the Nexus 30mm Omni wheels and then the Rotocaster 35mm Omni wheels. Uh, so either one is fine to use, uh, but some notes for the Rotocaster ones. Uh, so they're shipped from Australia, so that makes the shipping pretty expensive. Um, but uh, for us, we found an option, an alternative, option uh, sold on an alternative rotocaster being sold on Amazon. So that worked well for us. And we also noticed when we're designing our dominantry pod, it's much easier to create a real in inserts for the rotocaster. And then for side plates, this kind of depends on your design. Uh, but if you see the image on the left, on the right, uh, it's a parallel plate design and the two plates are meant to be 3D printed. And this is the open odometry design, which I'll talk about in the next slide. And but this is also reiterated so that it could use um, CNC metal parts, which increases rigidity, rigidity of the whole pod. And then lastly, the springs. 
Uh, so really, uh, we found that just we just used trial and error to test the different springs or rubber bands. Uh, but make sure that uh, you use the you use extension springs to spring your pods. And yeah. So if you don't want to go through the hassle of creating your own uh, custom odometry pods, uh, you can use different open source options. Uh, so there are three uh, ones that we looked at. So the open odometry, go rev odometry, and FTC team one 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 five gluten freeze odometry. Uh, so open odometry, uh, it was created by FTC team eighteen two one nine primitive data. Uh, so this is very robust. So it has three different side plates, and like I talked before, it was reiterated so that you could also do this with metal CNC plates, so that it makes the whole structural integrity very rigid, which we like. And then with compatibility, it has open source CAD, and it's easy to modify for uh, the uses that you want to use or if you want to improve it. And there's also a website for you to get other resources, like all the parts, and also if you have a 3D printer, they can assemble it for you and send it to you and for price uh, like i said it uses rotocaster so if you can find an alternative on a second uh, hand it would be much better and much cheaper and for design iterations it's been iterated many times like i said like for example the metal plates instead and also has been used by many ftc teams and has a big community for you to ask any questions so for go rep it has a unibody 3d printed shell uh, so this, with this, then you can't replace it with metal plates. And it also has open source CAD, and it's very easy to modify, like open odometry. It's fairly cheap, uh, but one downside is that it hasn't been reiterated on as much as open odometry. And then for gluten-free, it also has a unibody printed shell, uh, it has open source CAD files. And, and But one, two downsides is that, one, it uses the S14 encoders, which are quite expensive. And also, it hasn't been re reiterated on as much. So now I'll hand it off to Warren to talk about the software aspect. 
So now that we've gone over all the main aspects of odometry, let's summarize it all. Odometry in journal. It's extremely useful in navigation, and there are obviously many different approaches for hardware and software. There are lots of resources both online and within the FTC community. For dead wheel odometry in specific, there's minimal slipping in the wheels during acceleration, and therefore it's very accurate. So these are some resources that you can use that we've compiled for you. These will also be in the video description down below if you want to use them. Thank you so much for listening to our presentation.